Now, of course, the media is certainly changing. It's a very different world from when uh, I once entered it as a young radio reporter with the BBC in what we used to call ye good old days, um, after getting my degree in medical physiology, of all things. Um, now, I can't complain. It worked out really well for me, um, being the first South Asian, actually, on mainstream news in both the BBC and CNN. But um, at that time, pretty much the choice was the big media, which is why we've called this session, Is Social Media Killing Big Media? Because everything is changing. So please settle down, grab your seats. A lot of journalists in the, uh, in the big media, I think, are getting very disillusioned with the way things are going. Many of them are starting to look for uh, jobs in other areas. And uh, I tell the story of one of my friends who decided to give up working in the, big, the, in the media, one of my erstwhile CNN colleagues, and he said, I'm going to join the FBI. So I thought, okay, that's a strange choice. But anyway, he went off to do an interview with the FBI recruiting officer, who knew him, kind of having dealt with the CNN, but thought, you know, he's a journalist. Let's just ask him a few questions. Now, my friend wasn't the brightest cookie. He said to him, what's two plus two? My friend said, four. He said, what's the square root of 100? My friend said, 10. He said, who killed JFK? Who shot JFK? So my friend's like, I don't know. You know he says, oh, I tell you what, look, go home. You like the guy. He says, go home, think about it. We'll talk tomorrow. So I called my friend that evening, and I said, uh, so how did that interview for the FBI go? And he said, oh, it's great, great, really good. I said, did you get the job? He said, not only did I get the job, I'm already on a murder case. So, <laughs> so anyway, the, the definition of a reporter has changed, of course, with uh, citizen journalism uh, taking off, and anyone with a phone uh, with a camera on it can pretty much report what's happening. Breaking news comes out in seconds, and people are getting their news from different sources now, Twitter, of course, being a big one. Um, crowdsourcing and kind of information uh, sources have changed so much. So that's why we're asking, is social media killing big media? And we've got some very well-qualified people to discuss that. Uh, Katie Jacob Stanton is vice president of global media at Twitter, while Sarah Sands is the editor of the London Evening Standard. And our chair for the session is the chief content officer of the Hindustan Times, Nick Dawes. Please give them all a big welcome. So the title for the session is a pretty uh, robust question, a pretty clear headline. Uh, in our business, we like a slightly sensational headline. Uh, is social media killing traditional media? In fact, quite often you'll find on Twitter, for example, that a sensational headline is also what gets you the retweets and the high levels of engagement. So um, the, con the conversation that we need to have, however, and the questions that we need to ask are considerably more complicated than that binary question about whether traditional media institutions can thrive in a much more accelerated, much more connected, much more engaged and open digital world. Um, and they are questions about the commercial character of traditional media and whether, for example, in a situation where you learn about the killing of Osama bin Laden from a guy sitting on his roof in Pakistan, seeing some helicopters flying over and tweeting about it, where you learn that President Obama is going to visit India by a tweet from the Prime Minister last night, where readers are able to speak about the quality of the work we're doing, whether they like what we're doing or not in a very public way, criticize us very directly, whether we're able to survive in that setting. Um, these, these are complicated questions. On the other hand, um, journalists are all obsessed with social media. We love social media. We're trying to build social media teams, social media platforms, trying to figure out uh, how financially we can benefit from them, how we can tell stories using them, uh, who owns the audience nowadays, who owns the data, the masses of data that are being developed in this, in this space. So really we are trying to understand the shape of a whole new media ecosystem. And I think we're pretty well placed to address some of this debate today. So we have with us Sarah Sands, the editor of the London Evening Standard, a newspaper which um, has had an extraordinary journey over the last few years, which she'll tell us a little bit about. Um, Sarah started her career very much in the classical way on a local paper, I think the Seven Oaks Courier, and uh, worked her way up through the London Evening Standard, rose to being the um, Sunday editor of The Telegraph, um, at a time when The Telegraph was doing a lot of innovative change and a lot of digital work. Um, and has ultimately moved on uh, to be editor of The Standard. 
uh, many of you will know that the uh, London Evening Standard is an afternoon paper, and afternoon papers have faced particular challenges um, in, in the digital space, but it's nevertheless really, really thrived in recent years. So I think um, she's, she's ideally placed to be part of this discussion. And uh, Katie Stanton on my left is the global head of media for Twitter, every journalist's favorite social platform, I think. Something about all those little dopamine hits that you get. We all like a bit of dopamine um, uh, in, 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 in journalism. But, you know, Katie has a pretty dream uh, resume from a tech perspective. Yahoo in its glory days, I think. Um, a number of big, big projects at Google, including Open Social. Um, and then she spent some time, as many people in the tech and innovation space have, and particularly people who are interested in the intersection between tech and social change, uh, working with President Obama. Um, on citizenship, citizen engagement, and then working in the State Department on innovation. I, I was exposed to some of that work in South Africa where the, where the mission clearly picked up very directly um, uh, on your message. So I think between the two of you, we, we, we're well positioned both to have a bit of a ding-dong and a bit of an argument, um, and also to explore uh, some of these issues in a slightly more complex way. So I think, Katie, let's start off with you, um, and uh, then we'll hear from Sarah, we'll have a bit of a conversation, and then because this is a social discussion, it can't just be a one-way channel. We'll, we'll, we'll spend some time taking questions from the audience. Great. Thank you, Nick. And uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for having me today and all the participants in the room. It's a great honor for me to be here on stage with Nick and Sarah, as well as me, many of you, over the, the past couple of days. Um, and before we start the panel, I thought I would at least zoom out a little bit and tell you a little bit, a little bit about the mission of Twitter and what the global media team does. Um, our mission at Twitter is to help our users create and share and consume information that they care about in real time. And we believe that in doing so, that this open exchange of information can help make a positive impact in the world. And my team at Twitter works on making sure that we're getting the best content and something that we call participation experiences um, that are available on, on Twitter across many markets, across many languages, across many different types of content, um, from television to entertainment and news, of course, to politics. And we do this by working really closely with media organizations and public figures and helping them make the most out of our platform. And at Twitter, we're deeply, deeply committed to making sure that we work to help complement our partners, complementing the businesses that they have and delivering more engagement and more reach for their audiences. And we can talk about that a little bit later today. We're a technology company that happens to be in the media business. And as a result, we're working to complement, not necessarily to disrupt those businesses. And the other um, was something we thought counted against this was an evening readership, but it turned out um, that actually it's the one time of day that people are prepared, they've kind of had enough of emails, <laughs> you know, they've been at it all day, they've followed everything, and their just mind needs a bit of a rest, and they want on the way, they're traveling home, um, they just want to read something that's been curated, and is sort of thoughtful, and is a mix, and um, so they're happy just to read. Um, so those, those were the big advantages, and of course we're multi-platform, who wouldn't be? Um, so we built up our online, we um, have a television studio which um, has been very useful in providing video content. You know, but make no mistake, the paper's the mothership and that's where the news comes from. Um, and so, you know, Twitter, I, I embrace, you know, I love Twitter. Um, it, it is, um, as, as MK said, it's the conversation. But I would say it is interesting how often that conversation is about what you've read in the newspapers or what you've seen on television. So, you know, that thing of sort of being the seed to the news is, is still matters. Um, and I think, you know, it's great the way it sort of both follows news and certainly creates it. You know, it, it is fantastic that the announcement of the um, President Obama trip is, is through a tweet. Um, you know, I hope, I hope the newspapers will then do a job of sort of looking into what it all means. Um, it also, um, it, it, it sort of creates news actually for good or for bad. You know, for, for politicians it's been a, um, a great platform that they think of sort of bypassing um, uh, the um, old media. But also, of course, it has been, you know, their downfall too. We've had two resignations from politicians in Britain um, recently. The first um, through this... Um, inexplicable sort of new opportunity offered by 
Twitter, which is being able to tweet your private parts. And that's what happened to one of the politicians who resigned. Secondly, um, was a um, female politician who said something thoughtless um, that, that sounded um, uh, sneering about the working class. She, and she, so she immediately resigned. So there was a you know, sense of sort of you know, tweet and haste and repent at leisure. And I think people are still trying to get the hang of this form, you know, which I think people are getting better at. And of course, they're getting better at it. That's also for sort of for good or for bad, um, because you're now seeing sort of, you know, big interest moving in on what was this totally, you know, open, open medium. So I think what newspapers still have are, you know, influence. I think, you know, it's sort of slightly influence versus scale. I think there is a moment when stories pass from new media into traditional, you know, television or, or newspapers, that there's a kind of process of verification. And people like seeing, you know, they like seeing things in the paper. We have this, um, in England, a sort of a great um, business uh, guru who's been telling everyone to move advertising out of newspapers into new media. Newspapers are finished. No one wants it. You know, and he wrote a piece to this effect, which I said, so I'll put that online. He went, no, no, it's got to be in the newspaper. I want people to read it. You know, and I think there's still that thing of, you know, that there's something different for now about seeing something in a newspaper. Um, so I would say that the internet, you know, is clearly an alternative way of distributing news, um, you know, in a quick and fresh way. And I think it's also this opportunity for everyone to be journalists, which is a fantastic thing. You talked about, you know, being, being the witness, the bearing witness, and we've seen that terrific effect. You know, plus it's been amazing for cats and dogs. You know, who would have thought that they would be the great stars of the, of the new world? Um, but I think the, um, the, you know, that beauty of the form um, is also, can be, it's, you know, it's weakness. My daughter, who is, of course, total digital native, you know, gets her news from YouTube and so on. And she said the other day that, um, you know, it was odd because she didn't know whether anything was true or not. And actually, she didn't mind. You know, it didn't matter. She would watch something, it would be great, turn out that it was, you know, a fake or something. And she didn't mind. And I said, you know, I really think it matters. It really, really matters whether it's true or not. And I think that's still something that we have to, you know, come to terms with. The other thing that's the sort of slight storm um, on the horizon is this question of privacy. You know, it has been, um, social media has been a fantastic thing. It has been an act of public goodwill, you know, and trust. And um, now some people are starting to think, you know, maybe they would like their lives back or they want to know, you know, who's using that data and, and for what purpose. So I think, um, I think that's something that, you know, we'll have to be grappled with. And the last thing is, you know, the old media companies, I guess, versus the new media companies. So, you know, the, at first, um, in, in shorthand, old media companies sort of, you know, big, wicked, capitalists, sort of barons, you know, versus these... Um, you know, people who could do no harm. And um, I think, you know, we're all human beings. And in the end, um, you know, a little bit of the halo has to go. And, you know, I do note that the, you know, phrase sort of global citizens, you know, has also now been seen as a way of saying, you know, and we won't pay tax. So I think that's something that people have started to say, you know, that you've got to observe the rules in the way that, you know, boring old media had to observe, uh, had to observe the rules too. So I think there'll be a shakedown. As for newspapers themselves, um, physically they may not exist in a form in, in 20 years time. I think, um, you know, journalism will survive. Whether newspapers do physically, I don't know, but I think what will happen is maybe they'll become like, you know, the analogy of the steam train that, you know, it, there was the great steam train and then of course it was overtaken by, you know, diesel and electric and so on, but there are still some sort of crazy rich people who keep steam trains and, and sometimes they take them out for show and, you know, thousands and thousands of people come to watch and, and I think, you know, we may have lost um, a wonderful thing. Thank you. So, so I think what's very evident from both of these contributions is that we're not really just forcing this conversation on you because we are HT Media and we care about our own business and our own stuff and we want you to all listen. Um, these are uh, very fundamental questions about key social institutions, um, institutions of information, accountability, entertainment um, that matter to all of us. And I, I think one of the things, and you've touched on it um, briefly, is that's been debated here in India, but also in the US, has been this question of, of politicians being able to uh, short circuit the traditional press, being able to 
uh, engage directly with citizens, which is wonderful, something you did a, a lot of work on yourself. But on the other hand, many people have raised concerns, and it's been raised quite actively uh, here in Delhi, that this becomes a way to evade tough questions and to engage, evade the, the sort of deeper engagement with another big, strong institution. Uh, do you, do you, is that a concern, or you know, having worked both in, in that governance space and in the, in the social media space, do you think there are other ways in which the platform uh, corrects for that? I think net-net, it's a great opportunity to sort of democratize access to people of influence, to be able to ask a head of state, a public figure of any sort, a question directly, and to hear directly from that person of, of influence. At the same time, we'll always need journalists to make sense of the issues and to help sort of curate opinion and curate different perspectives and offer very strong opinions on either side. And I think it's also amazing and incredible that we have in front of us that we can hear the conversations unfold in real time. We can see the Prime Minister of India welcoming the President of the United States in a public forum and seeing the conversation unfold around that. Um, and it's not just politicians. It could be around Bollywood. It could be around cricket. It could be around, um, you know, flood relief. Um, something that we saw also unfold in Kashmir. So I think net net, it's a great thing, um, but it's sort of an evolving thing of finding out the different roles and responsibilities. And you know, in a, in a more local way, as an editor of a city paper, and you know, for HT, the, the city that we live in, Delhi in this case, or Mumbai, is very very important to our work and our ability to engage with with our community around civic issues and, and immediate local stuff is is pretty critical. Are, are your team able to use, do you use social to, to, to try and connect more deeply with London? Um, or are there other mechanisms that are more uh, effective uh, for you? Um, yes, absolutely you do. You want to know what people care about and you want to know what's happening. But I, it's back to that sort of slight process of verification where I'd say there's still a role. There was an example yesterday of a, you know, a, 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 um, on Twitter that there'd been a, it was a, Balcony collapse or something, but it was in a you know it was in a smart street. It was an interesting story. So you think, oh, you know that's interesting. And then it was a, it was actually a news reporter who had tweeted it, by the way. So you know yeah. journalists are not sort of excluded from this process. And then you get a lot of theories of what it could be, which is mostly wrong. And then you get sort of irrelevant um, observations of. Um, uh, you know, I um, I was at that square, name wrong, spelt wrong. You know, t ten years ago or something. And then, but you know, it's all happening. You sort of think, oh, something's happening. And then, you know, I'm afraid there's an entirely traditional, you know, reporter goes down there, you speak to the police station. You know, the kind of those uh, those old 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 tricks. And you know, and you and you come to um, a conclusion of what actually happened. So that's your finished article. So I, I think that sort of first draft thing is brilliant. You know, but. It, it, it's not enough on its own. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that, 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 that we see with our journalists who are successful on social platforms is that it's actually when they do some of their traditional storytelling in real time hmm. uh, exactly. that they really win an audience and engage it. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I could share one example from London that um, when there was a helicopter crash in a building, and maybe this was what you're referring to, um, that we were able to see, we have this really fantastic visualization, we were really intrigued to see who had the first tweet about it and how did news organizations respond and participate. And so uh, Eyewitness captured the image and then the video on Twitter and, and broadcasted it out. And then s suddenly a few journalists noticed it and started asking questions, trying to confirm the, the veracity of what was going on. And what you could see in the evolution of the storytelling was that, um, that the BBC, who has been great on Twitter, they have all of their journalists active on Twitter, they started engaging in what was going on, and they began to actually start tell the full story of what was happening. And, um, and so you sort of see that blend of the eyewitnesses and see this unfolding in real time, but ultimately it was you know, traditional journalists who started to own the conversation, started getting more retweets and more favorites, more engagement, and, and, and more distribution, mind you, around the world of what was going on. So clearly from that, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there's a very clear path to build relevance on this platform and to, and to, and to as you say, own the conversation. I, I, do we know at all how to monetize that other than driving traffic to our sites, which we struggle to monetize already? Well, yeah. 
Sure. Um, so maybe I'll give you another example yeah. from television. So Twitter has become, as I mentioned earlier, this sort of social soundtrack of what's going on uh, on television. And Twitter wasn't really born for television. It's just been sort of this organic experience that as we, um, you know, over the past few years, I think all of us, show of hands, how many of you have your telephone within arm's reach? Like everybody? Come on, I know you do. Yeah, it's just <laughs> Everybody true. does. It's Let's just, just say true. everyone does. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and what has happened is that as we watch television, um, people start having these conversations about it. Like, this is a great show or this is a horrible show. I love what's happening I hate what's happening. And you start finding other people who are simultaneously watching the show as well. And broadcasters, we start to talk to them and understanding their needs and saying, well, you know, we kind of want to make money out of this. This is great. And so, um, and this is important to us, and so our teams have worked on something called Twitter Amplify um, that works with broadcasters, and as they have really rich pieces of content, it could be the game-winning score, it could be, um, you know, um, some magnificent play, it could be a dramatic finale to a series, um, that they're able to monetize that content that they put on Twitter. Um, either they can sell it from their sales team or we can sell it from our sales team and we'll you know, share in the revenue. Um, but it's sort of like an innovative way that we're trying to work with media partners that not only do they benefit from the reach and distribution um, and, and the traffic that they get, but also from the content that they're able to share on our platform. Okay, so according to the doomsday clock, we have 14 minutes and 35, 34, 33 to go. So this is a discussion about social, so we're going to take questions and not be a one-way channel. Um, and I'm going to take the gentleman in the red tie over there with his hand up. Hi. Um, I have a question. Actually, I have a comment and a question. Um, um, uh, Sarah, you spoke about uh, digital natives, and I think it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's spot on what you're saying. Uh, I have a 10-year-old daughter, and, you know, uh, she's had an iPad since she was four. I bought her a MacBook Pro two years ago. Uh, but I also appreciate that uh, she gets the Hindustan Times at school, and she reads it. And, and I'm hoping uh, that she's uh, not the last generation of people who, uh, you know, want their um, uh, cup of coffee in the morning uh, with a newspaper. I, I know I will be, lifelong, no matter how much uh, digital consumption I do. But what I want to ask you about is, uh, is something else. It's, I feel that uh, the, the, uh, the risk to you is not so much from, tw uh, uh, from Twitter, although Twitter is, is huge. It's un unbelievably powerful. Uh, Real-time reportage, uh, Twitter has, has revolutionized it. But what about things like uh, things that you say about curation? Um, uh, there's, uh, there's an online magazine called Flipboard, uh, and it's ilk, <coughs> where the curation actually happens automatically. Google's got these amazing algorithms that just takes away even the human element of uh, creating a curation uh, for what I want to hear and like. So I use Flipboard, and it's, and it's spooky how good it is at predicting what I might be interested in getting. So I want to ask you, how, uh, how much of a risk can, is that on your horizon? Do you actually, you know, does it give you sleepless nights? Uh, does Flipboard uh, give you sleepless nights? Is the algorithm nights? going to replace the editor? I think yes, that's a very that's pertinent that's question. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think... You know, two questions are related. Really hope don't lose the habit. And I love the way you, you, you talk about how you read a newspaper, a cup of coffee, you know, you relax, you sit back. And then what happens is that you read um, a paper, and there are things that you know you'll be interested in, but there may be other things that you didn't know you were interested in. And um, so I think that's where the algorithm, I hope, um, doesn't, you know, don't, doesn't answer all the needs of humanity, that you don't always know what... It just means that um, you will... You're, your world will become a little bit narrow if, if you're only responding to what, um, what the data says are your interests. You know, that sometimes things may happen totally randomly. And I quite like the sort of miscellaneous nature of newspapers that in one place you've got, you know, arts, entertainment, um, news, you know, politics, sport. Um, even though, you know, the algorithm would say, no, you're not interested in that, so we're not going to show you. And, and I, I do notice still, you know, that there's a sort of clickbait view of, you know, the spikes in, in news, and of course one should respond to that. Um, but if you followed it exactly, you would have a very, very weird um, 
view of human nature as well as what you're interested in. I mean, I'm being polite. You, you mentioned a flipboard which begins with an F. There's another, there's another platform that begins with an F, um, but we don't want to use F words. But is there, is there a difference between open platforms and closed platforms in the level of serendipity and the level of exposure to JT? Of course. I mean, Twitter is you know, uh, an open platform, it has a couple of characteristics that are quite unique. So it's live, it's public, it's conversational. And what's really unique about a tweet is that a tweet travels. Um, a tweet can travel to third-party websites. It can be displayed on television. It can be referred to in the press, um, on radio and, and other formats. So, um, so it's quite unique um, and in and, and, and that way. So, um, you know, and your question is a good one. It's something that we think about in terms of, you know, um, we offer a real-time service. The tweets will flow. It's a real-time based um, type of a platform. But we have um, experimented, for example, during the, the World Cup, offering people, uh, uh, users and fans, a sort of curated experience. If you go to a certain timeline um, to follow the World Cup, imagine you could do that for cricket um, and the Cricket World Cup. So, you know, curation is hard. You might not know what the best sites are. So it's something that, you know, we've experimented with in terms of very specific events that if you want to see this um, timeline of great cricket scores and timelines and perspectives from coaches and fans, um, that might be just another way to be able to consume something that you care about. Okay, I want to take a question from Vinod Mehta. This is me curating the questions a little bit. I hope you don't mind, but Vinod's one of the great Indian editors and a recent arrival on social media. Can we get a mic up in the front for Vinod? You know, I've been a print journalist for over 45 years, and I have no great interest in the progress of the social media. Uh, but uh, I think I welcome the social media because it's a challenge to us in the print to reinvent ourselves. But that is not my question. The question I want to ask you is that I am both a victim and an admirer of the social media. And I am a victim because I am exposed to the most unadulterated abuse in the social media. I am abused. My wife is abused. My dog is abused. Now, I, is there the legitimacy and the credibility of the social media? There will always be a question mark. I'm not saying you have some sort of censorship, but you have to get some way to filter out stuff which is pure abuse. And until you do that, I think, in the social media, it, there will always be uh, the question... That is this for real, or is this a bit of fun that we are having? Okay, so, so, so I'm going to start with Katie on this. I think anyone who's a prominent person at all who's spent time on, on social media in any country, but particularly in this country, has been experienced to the revenge of the trolls. Um, bullying is something that's been debated quite a bit. Um, gender questions. How, how are you guys responding to those issues? Sure. Um, so just to zoom out a little bit. We have abuse in the offline world. We have abuse on the online world, on the internet. We have it on multiple platforms. So it's not something that's really unique really to social media or even specific to Twitter. Um, that said, it's something we take really seriously. We want Twitter to be the safest place for people to have a really you know, care, caring and, and thoughtful conversation about you know, what you care about and your various interests. So um, we do have a couple of tools that we have, and, and our team is here too, to help walk people through any of those specific tools in terms of looking at your at replies to only see, for example, the mentions um, for people you may mutually follow or for other verified accounts, things like that. But it's something we're also investing in. Um, to give you some perspective, we see about a billion tweets every couple of days. That's a lot of conversation. So what we're investing in is building an engineering and product team that can help scale and making sure that the platform um, abides by certain rules of the road. Um, and we're also investing from a sort of human perspective of having teams that when there is abuse on the platform, things that do violate either law, if there's a direct threat, um, or also that violates our terms of service, um, that we can take quick action um, so people can have a, a really good experience on, on Twitter. How, how do you handle being exposed to unfiltered reader opinions? Well, it is interesting, as you, as you say, because um, 
you know, British newspapers always had a reputation of being pretty rough. Um, and yet now, you know, we've just seen this, these just byword for civility <laughs> compared to, you know, this new unregulated world. And, you know, we've all had the green ink letters about, you know, spaceman is going to land and so on. And, you know, we, we, we deal with those respectfully. This is, this is really different. And I'm interested about, so, you know, you're right, of course, it's always existed. But um, it, possibly it's the anonymity that's, you know, afforded that people feel that they can go further or... Um, it, some of the cases are extraordinary. Also, it happens, I mean, I suppose it's the best and worst of human nature in a very, very short time scale. There was an example I, I mentioned earlier of um, was a British astrophysicist who was behind getting a spaceship to land on a comet. So, tremendous, exciting Twitter experience. You know, he was mad about Twitter, did it all on Twitter. Everyone said, isn't this just sort of, you know, isn't this all about the wonder of space and discovery and community and we're all together and we've watched this comment. Next thing, he's in tears because he wore a shirt with um, uh, some um, women on it. Well, naked ladies, uh, in fact. And so, then everyone's turned on him. No, you're a sexist pig and, you know, you... Um, so everyone's forgotten about the comet. <laughs> Spaceship's just forgotten about. He's in tears. He has to apologize. You know, he says he's going to leave Twitter. And it, it, all in this cycle of a week, you know, and you just think it's, it's a sort of extraordinary, it's an extraordinary thing that's happening. It's some, and I don't know if it's some, there's a slight sort of hysteria to the time scale or that makes people behave differently. Um, but I think what, what I, you do see people coming off Twitter and then, you know, they're leaving it a bit and, and they come back. And monitoring, I suppose, is the only way. We have, I, you know, I thought we could save on staff, but, um, you know, monitors, you just have to have that because otherwise, apart from defamation and everything else, you know, you can't just, you can't just leave readers' response online open. So there you have it. Social media means more jobs for journalists. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I see the lady in the pink jacket. Um, you want to make yourself obvious to the microphone, um, police? Hi, uh, my question is, uh, we use social media for businesses these days a lot. So I wanted to ask you, how do we calculate the ROI and measure it for our business? Um, what's unique with Twitter, the way that we've actually built our advertising platform, is that we have made it very sort of natural to the experience. So we offer something called promoted tweets, promoted trends, and promoted accounts. Promoted tweets is sort of the lion's share of what we offer. So you can imagine as a brand being able to reach people in the moment um, during any kind of particular um, event. Um, and our ads are, are served by your particular interests. So if you're following a certain suite of accounts, um, if it's you know, heavy sports related, then it's likely that we might serve you a Nike ad because we think it will be relevant. And as a result, we've been able to see like very, very strong engagement that outperforms, say, banner ads or other types of advertising platforms on other sites. Um, over here in the front. Kerry, first of all, it's great to see another Columbia SIPA alum up there. Yes, go SIPA. Um, question for you around social media. Uh, clearly, social media is a very, very powerful influence in the world today. With great power comes great responsibility. And thus, what do you see as the larger purpose and impact and contribution that Twitter and generally social media can have on the world and society? Yeah, I mean, it's a quote that one of our founders, Biz Stone, had early on that, and I mentioned this earlier as well, that you know, we believe that the open exchange of information can have a positive impact in the world. Twitter has become this democratic way of accessing information. It doesn't matter if you're on a smartphone in San Francisco or you're on a rudimentary feature phone in Sub-Saharan Africa, you still have access to the same information. It um, doesn't matter what your language is. It doesn't matter what your gender is. That you're still able to contribute, to learn, and feel empowered. Um, there are amazing stories around the world that motivate us every day. It's a very, Twitter's a very mission-driven company, that people come because they really do believe in this potential. Things like, you know, a, a woman in Saudi Arabia who she doesn't have the right to drive and she goes on Twitter to tell the world and to show the world that she's driving and women around the world to be able to encourage her and say, I hear you, I believe in you, I support you. During the very tragic rape of, gang rape of women here in Delhi, 
that this wasn't a conversation isolated to Delhi. This was heard around the world. And for people to be able to share in their grief and their anger um, and, and to really unite and rally, that's a really moving thing. That stories aren't buried, they're heard and they're listened to, and more, most importantly, they're felt and acted upon. Okay, so we have one minute. Uh, this gentleman at the front in the gray suit. My question is to Ms. Sarah. I take off from what Mr. Vinod Mehta said that the public figures are subjected to public, often public ridicule, false allegations. They are uh, more vulnerable. In the print media, they have a legal remedy in the form of defamation, which is a very strict uh, law in India. It's, it's, uh, and it acts as a deterrent. What is the safeguard in the social media uh, for public figures against uh, false allegations and uh, persistent uh, uh, ridicule which they are subjected to. Has it uh, thought been given to it? We have had um, at least one case comes to mind um, in Britain of a politician um, suing for defamation for something online. And it was an interesting one because it was absolutely the conversation. Um, uh, it was a response to a story about who was um, involved in a paedophile scandal and someone said why is everyone on Twitter talking about um, this politician innocent face was the um, little quotation mark and he, he got her for that and, she, um, and she, did, she did pay so I think it was what I was saying earlier you know, some rules are going to have to um, are going to have to come into force, I think, that you can't have, you know, one world that is, um, you know, free of them all and, and another not. And actually the whole sense of sort of regulation, uh, e even the, you know, founder of um, Tim Berners-Lee of um, World Wide Web is now saying, you know, we need, some, we need some rules or we need some sort of constitution because there are a lot of big questions now being raised, like data, um, like defamation, um, you know, we, we in the um, old media, you know, very ev envious of this unregulated um, atmosphere. You know, the, um, the newspapers in Britain, have, you know, have the, have the sword hanging over them at the moment. But um, I think um, this, will, this will all have to shake out over the next few years, I think. And, of course, one of the things that happens is that the community regulates quite a lot what, what happens in the space. Um, yeah. And that's a whole fascinating debate in itself. Mm. Our time is up. There's no place more social, more argumentative, more newsy than India, and Delhi in particular. So you can join us on Twitter if you like afterwards. We're all there. And we can keep the conversation going. Thanks so much.